Okay, so let me go ahead and introduce our event and our speaker for this evening. Uh, this is the annual NZEAL Distinguished Lecture Series. And NZEAL stands for the New Zealand Experimental Economics Lab. It is a world-class experimental lab, uh, lab facility. And uh, we're able to, through that facility, attract truly world-class scholars, like uh, the man I'm about to introduce here. Um, uh, before I introduce him, let me say the format for this evening is the lecture will be about an hour, and then afterwards there'll be an opportunity to go ahead and ask questions. All right, our distinguished speaker tonight is Simone Gechter. Uh, he is currently the Professor of Psychology of Economic Decision Making at the University of Nottingham. He received his doctorate uh, in economics in 1994 from the University of Vienna. And before going on to Nottingham, he has lectured at the University of Vienna, University of Linz, and Zurich, and St. Gallen. Um, he has published over 50 journal articles, including articles in the most prestigious uh, uh, outlets in the respective fields, such as science and nature, uh, top economic journals such as the American Economic Review, and Econometrica. And for those who find these things interesting, uh, he has been cited, um, I believe, three or 4,000 times in Web of Science. So his work is uh, very closely watched and has had a profound impact on the discipline. His main research areas are in the field of experimental and behavioral economics. He has long been interested in the role of social norms in economic decision making. His research draws on insights from psychology and sociology, anthropology, and biology, and uses methods from experimental economics to understand basic issues in the psychology of cooperation. He's probably most famous for his papers in the area of reciprocity, voluntary cooperation, and punishment. Um, in recent years, he has also been interested uh, in the role of cultural influences on norms of cooperation for which he collected, he is currently collecting data at our NZEAL lab. Um, in many ways, he's uh, part of a relatively new wave of researchers that have greatly rocked the field of economics over the last 20 years by challenging the uh, conventionally held assumptions of neoclassical economics and opening up the field uh, to the area of behavioral economics. And I think it's fair to say that uh, Professor Gechter has been at the forefront of that wave of new researchers. His work is provocative, at times controversial, uh, but always thought provoking. So will you please join me in welcoming Professor Gechter. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. I feel very honored to be the uh, speaker of this uh, distinguished uh, lecture series. Uh, I'm pleased to work here in this laboratory, which is really a state-of-the-art facility. Actually, I'm a bit envious because my lab, where I do my research, is not as nice as yours. So uh, I might come back here. So, um, and I take this opportunity to talk about uh, the line of research we're doing. Um, this is a bit of a grand title, if, what, if we could predict human behavior in labor markets, but uh, at least we shed a little bit of light on, I think, what is going on. And it's, you know, it's from an economics perspective, as you will see. I'm an economist. I do experimental economics, but I'm very much interested in real human behavior. So and that's what we do. And we explore it under a perspective that hopefully sheds some light on how real markets, labor markets in particular, actually work. So that's what we want to do. So uh, the first and fundamental question to any economist is, is the labor market just like any market? So if you pick up an economics textbook, probably, you know, uh, certainly until not very long ago, it didn't very much matter whether we are talking about labor markets or whether we are talking about fruit markets or, uh, to some extent, about stock markets or some other commodity markets. We have the one and the same uh, model of how we think markets operate. Supply and demand, and that basically explains how we believe markets operate. And uh, you know, if there is unemployment, this is because uh, labor is too expensive, relatively speaking. 
and so on. So these are the, the, the type of issues that uh, uh, or approaches that economists have been using, and the labor market is not really special, you know, in, in an important sense, in this important sense. The question is, is that true? People always had a suspicion that, uh, you know, even economists had a suspicion that the labor market is actually different. And what I will explore uh, today is the reason why it's different, and that has to do with the fact that I will try to convince you today that what is special about it, in particular, I mean, there are many things, but uh, the thing that uh, will be the focus tonight is that the employment relationship, you know, is also a social relationship. It's not just an economic exchange. Yeah? When if, I, if I buy a car, that's just an economic exchange. I buy a car and I, that's it. You know, I get the car, I use it. It's a pure economic exchange. If I buy a job as an employer, I buy a human being. And that human being has some sort of sentiments about what he or she, she thinks is fair and just and how he compares with other people and so on. There is deeply entrenched, it's a social relationship. And we will see another fundamental reason why uh, the labor relationship actually is a social relationship, which has to do with the fact that uh, uh, it, 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 many, many things that actually are relevant for the exchange of the, of the, uh, of, of, of the employment uh, relationship is actually not fully specified in a contract. And that what, we, what economists call contractual incompleteness. It's very much unspecified what we actually do in the job, which means Lots of, uh, there's lots of uh, leeway for employees how to behave. And that means that something like social norms might matter a lot for what people actually do on the job. And this is the aspect that will be an important focus tonight. So I have uh, structured my talk basically in two parts. The first part, which will be the longest one, will try to introduce the idea, the motivation for why we look in this research as economists at all. And then what we can learn, and I will introduce the experimental methodology. I will show you how we can study this question. You know, what are potential implications of the employment relationship being a social relationship for understanding some important market phenomena, potentially. Yeah. And in the second part, I will use these insights, some of these insights that we have gained to study another important question of current research, which is, what does all this imply for our understanding of incentives? Incentives, performance incentives, pay for performance have always been at the heart of what economists have been interested in. So uh, if the employment relationship is a social relationship, this might also have some important uh, consequences for our understanding of how incentives work or what we can expect. So part one, the behavioral economics of the employment relation and its consequences for wage formation. So that's what we uh, want to study first. And uh, I start with, an, uh, I, I'm going back in time now a bit in terms of the questions that have, been, uh, that have given uh, rise to this particular line of research. And uh, here is a, <coughs> uh, a picture that uh, tells a bit of the story. This is not experimental data. These are, so, so to speak, real data from wages from a, a large data set of wages in a, in a study that uh, looked at data, wage data, from 16 countries. And in particular, what this study uh, is interested in is in which direction do wage, wage changes actually go? And as you can see here, um, most of the wage changes are, uh, around, are positive. So wages don't change. Uh, downwards, or at least at a much lower frequency. This is negative wage changes, so wage decreases. Yeah, and this is wage increases. If wages change, they change only in one direction, which is what uh, has long been argued, even back, by, back to the times of Keynes, that nominal wages are rigid. They are, we can't lower wages. They are rigid, which is from a purely competitive labor market perspective. If that's the case, supply and demand, then in particular, if there is a recession, if there is a downturn, we should see lower wages. But we don't see lower wages, at least not to an extent that we would expect if markets were completely flexible, if wages would not be rigid. So this is not a new observation. It really goes back to the times of Keynes, and people have argued it for a long time. Data have become better and better and better. So we have, and uh, econometric skills of economists and statistical skills have become better too. So we now have, now have can have impressive figure like this one to, to pin this down and explain it and show it. So 
again, you know, wages are downward rigid, which has an important implication. If wages are rigid, then this might imply unemployment. So, <clears throat> uh, for an economist, what are, you know, we want to explain why wages are rigid, then um, one important implication that the economists always assume, there are basically two types of implications. Yeah? Wages are rigid because we have exogenously, institutionally, legally uh, imposed restrictions on wages. Wages can't get lower and one of the reasons is that we have trade unions and they, and obviously they don't like that wages de de decrease and so that's one reason for why wages might be not downwardly flexible. Uh, so, um, um, the, and um, you know, the, the lobbying that they might have on legis legislation and so on, and, and labor regulation laws and inflexible labor markets are all a reason, a potential reason for why uh, uh, wages are, are rigid. However, another possibility that economists have been pondering, and one very famous Nobel laureate, George Akerlof in particular, is maybe, you know, another possible explanation is that wages are, flex, uh, are downwardly rigid, are inflexible for a profit-maximizing reason. Firms do not want you know, to lower wages. Why could that possibly be the case? That's a very good question. You know, why, why could firms have an incentive uh, to, uh, to not to lower wages? Yeah, that's, the quest, that's a very good question. So if, if, if wages are just the price of a scarce resource that like uh, like if buying, buying commodities, then you would always try to push wages down as much as possible. But if wages have an important motivation function, that's the argument that we will explain in a second, yeah, then firms might think, well, it's not, you know, if I reduce wages, I, re I destroy motivation. If I destroy motivation, I have lower profits. So wage rigidity, according to Akerlof, um, can arise endogenously as a part of a profit-maximizing strategy, even if there are no trade unions to interfere in the labor market, even if labor laws are as flexible as possible, this possibility might arise. So this, I thought, uh, uh, and me and many others uh, thought is a very interesting um, um, idea, and here is the argument. Why is that? Yeah, the employment relationship is not just a relationship of an exchange of goods and a contract. Yeah, it's more, it's a social relationship. And that means that something like a norm of quid pro quo or reciprocity or gift exchange might actually be operative in many, many jobs. In particular, the ones which, are, which require, uh, which are not more than just purely standard, standard, uh, simple jobs. And the idea is here, and Akerlof in his famous paper in 1982 already argued based on some case studies and studies by sociologists that what we can observe in naturally occurring situation, sometimes at least, is that firms, companies pay good wages and offer good working conditions and in exchange, quid pro quo, gift exchange, uh, workers respond, employees respond with a good work morale. Yeah? So good wages and good working conditions uh, are reciprocated by good work morale and it's called gift exchange because What's a good wage? Better than a market wage? What, you could, what the firm could offer given what the going market rate is? What's good work morale doing more than you would have to do necessarily? You know, what, how you could uh, get by uh, just by doing uh, according to uh, the call of duty, not more. Yeah? So that's the employment relationship as a gift exchange relationship. And uh, it's a good idea. And it has to do with the following uh, observation. Yeah. Uh, to which I alluded briefly before. Employment contracts are incomplete contracts. What does that mean? An incomplete contract means that the essence of what is being exchanged is not really contractually regulated. To see, to see this, let's give an example of a complete contract. Suppose you buy a car. If you buy a car, you buy a well-specified commodity of a car of a particular size, particular color, particular equipment, you have a specified price, you pay it, that's the exchange. This is a so-called complete contract because everything that's relevant to the exchange, the specifics of the car and how you're going to pay for it are regulated, determined, fi fixed in the contract and they are enforceable by third parties like the courts. Yeah, if I go, if I don't pay or if the car is not delivered in the specification I asked for, I can claim it and can enforce it. So that's a complete contract. 
But the employment relationship of most but the very simplest jobs is not like that. Actually, beyond what, how many hours you have to work and what your payment is going to be, and sort of broadly speaking what you're going to do, not much more is regulated. In my employment contract, for example, it doesn't say, it says I should do teaching, I should do research, and I should be a good citizen and help in admin. But that is extremely vague. What I really do, you know, traveling the world and giving talks and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, is not part of the, of the specification. Whether I do a lousy job as a teacher, as long as I do my teaching, there is some lower limit, but not much. What I really do, what really affects the quality, is not specified in the contract. This is not because the University of Nottingham, my employer, somehow have lousy HR department who don't know how to write employment contracts. I guess most of your contracts, those of you who work, are similarly unspecified. That's called an incomplete contract. That is a very important motivation, observation, that is the case. It's really not my observation. Many scholars in this area have made this before. Um, um, it goes sometimes under the heading of work morale, creativity, the initiative, goodwill, organizational citizenship behavior. That's all necessary to make such an incomplete contract uh, workable. Yeah? Uh, 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 a book, a very nice book by Truman Bewley. Truman Bewley makes uh, this uh, important observation. After having interviewed many labor market participants, workers have so many opportunities to take advantage of employers that it's not wise to depend on coercion and financial incentives for loners motivated. You need this kind of uh, goodwill thing. Yeah, this is intimately related to the idea that the employment contract is incomplete. Yeah, you can always get by by doing just the minimum. Yeah, you have always leeways in almost, but in all but the simplest jobs, you can always have some leeways how well you do your job, how motivated you are, how loyal you are, you know, how, how much effort you put in. That's called voluntary cooperation. You know, it's not really something that you can enforce. Yeah, it's not enforceable. What is enforceable is a, a minimum, yeah, but not more. And that has an important uh, uh, implication because it's often just a handshake. Yeah, promises, an exchange of goodwill that governs these contracts. It sometimes works well and sometimes not that well. We will see one of the determinants of this. But that is a, a really fundamentally important thing and that is at the core of why employment relationships are different from just pure exchange relationships in good and commodity markets. Um, so, well, you can ask, that's all good and nice. Um, how important is it? Now I'm coming to the empirical side of things. So this was general arguments, ideas, concepts. Yeah. And um, I refer to this uh, very impressive book by Truman Bewley, who was a pure economic theorist. But he made this observation that I started this talk with, wages don't fall in a recession. And he wrote the book entitled, Why Wages Don't Fall in a Recession. And he couldn't understand it, because according to his training as an economic theorist, there was unemployment in where he was living, and, but wages didn't seem to react at all. So how could that possibly be? Because if there's unemployment, according to the neoclassical standard economic model, wages should go down, go down, go down, but they didn't react at all. So what he did was is very unusual for an economist. He went actually out and thought, well, maybe I learned something from just asking the labor market participants why they don't lower the wages. You know, why don't you take advantage of this situation? You have so many unemployed, you know, you can get them in the door by just uh, lowering the wages. And the reason why they didn't do it, and this is a 300 four, or 400 pages book, so uh, this is a very short answer here. He said, it's work morale. Yeah? The reason why this is so important is work morale. Yeah? Maybe I give the result here. It says work morale is important because if morale is bad, we have low productivity. Why does that matter? Why is it not controlled? Because contracts are incomplete. You can't enforce very high productivity. Many times, you know, even the simple worker can do a lousy job in flipping the burger. Yeah? So good morale means a sense of common purpose, consistent with company goals, cooperativeness, happiness, and tolerant, tolerance of unpleasantness, zest for the job, moral behavior, mutual trust, ease of communication with superiors and subordinates. This is what work morale is. This is what defines how people actually behave. All of us who work know this, although you know, as, an economist, we, as economists we have had our blind spots on this. But here is a, 
a very, uh, a very impressive uh, uh, set of results. Low productivity. It's not, you know, this is the, the, the main thing. 89% of all the uh, interviewed personnel managers, these are 104 personnel managers answered this particular question, said, you know, we care about work morale because if it's low, we have low productivity. And uh, low productivity over this has profit consequences. So, so you might ask yourself, okay, as economists, you know, economy, this is impressive. It's really impressive and very important and laudable study. But economists, for various reasons, have always been skeptical of uh, asking people. You know, you know, because what people say is one thing, what they do is another thing. So here come experiments. So let's do what to see what we can learn from experiments. What's the comparative advantage of laboratory experiments to start with? So I already said one reason. Economists are skeptical of what people say. Let's see what they do. Yeah, that's one uh, important uh, uh, reason. Moreover, you know, once from a scientific point of view, you really want to understand what the importance of these morale arguments, these social norms, and this cooperativeness and goodwill and all that, what this really is. You know, then the problem is there, is there are always lots of other factors going around. You know, that you have career concerns, you have your neighbors, you don't want to mess up with your boss because you like him, you have this and you have that, and, and uh, lots of other confounding concurrent influences that, that do not allow you, from a scientific point of view, to draw a conclusion that this is really the important thing. Maybe it's just a lot of other factors that, uh, uh, that happen here at the same time. So, so in natural occurring situation, we have these concurrences of influences and we, which make it very difficult, if not impossible, to draw a conclusion what the real source of the, of the issue is. So that means, you know, when we observe a gift exchange, what we, when we observe something that looks like a gift exchange, it might not be a gift exchange at all. It might, might be just a strategic reaction to what you perceive to be the best situation here, the best response here. How do we know that this is gift exchange? Yeah? It's possible, it's plausible, maybe possibly, but uh, we can't really say from a scientific point of view. So this is why economists were always unconvinced by this type of answers or this George Akerlof's argument for a long while as well. Yeah. So the general idea is, if something is really important uh, as a behavioral phenomenon, if this goodwill thing, this reciprocity, this gift exchange are important, then we should be able to detect it under controlled conditions. So this is why what we mean by, uh, uh, by doing experiments. So, if a phenomenon is relevant, then we should observe it under the control conditions. So we observe incentivized behavior. So what we do to study this, we go to a laboratory. So here is, uh, this is the NCL computer lab as an example of uh, how we do experiments. And uh, if we go there, we find this very nice equipment of which I'm envious. And uh, we meet the director of the lab uh, and we can ask him, what is a lab experiment? And he will say the following. We recruit volunteer uh, uh, participants here. We, depending on the exact condition and situation, we randomly allocate them to their roles in this experiment. We explain them the decision situation, the problem that we want to study. People have to answer some questions to see whether they understand what they are asked to do. We use anonymous interaction. Uh, typically using some software. We don't deceive them, so what we tell them is actually what you're going to do. We don't trick them into something. And we pay them according to decisions. Yeah? So we observe economic decision making under control conditions. And I'm going to introduce you now to uh, such an example, how we can study this and how we can test this. Yeah? So we are interested in the idea can we test this gift exchange argument, this morale argument, in an economic experiment, in a, in a way where we control for all the incentives that possibly can influence people's behavior? Yeah, so this is really inspired by George Akerlof's idea you know, of this give, give and take, this quid pro quo, good wages for good work morale. But in a way that allows, you know, using the tools of modern economic theory, to, to study the incentives, to control the incentives that people might actually face in this situation. So this is their idea. So we do an experiment uh, and where we invite people uh, to the laboratory 
uh, volunteers and we assign them to two roles, employer and worker, respectively. So um, um, in what do they do? The employer makes a wage offer in this experiment, uh, and that the, which is a, a particular uh, level of money that he can offer. It's a fixed wage to a, to an, to, to a participant in the role of the worker or the employee. This particular worker or employee observes this wage offer. He can say, well, I take it or I reject it. If I reject it, we, we, we stop and we, we don't get we don't end anything. If I accept it, I choose a particular effort level where effort in the first set of experiments I will be talking about is just choosing a number. Yeah, with the interpretation, the higher the number is, the more New Zealand dollars I have to give up. Yeah. So choosing effort level one, equivalent to, to not working very much, is very cheap. Choosing effort level 20 is very expensive. I have to give up money. As yeah, a consequence of that, people, uh, we can calculate what people earn, and we pay them according to their decision. So the... Uh, this, is, this mimics, in a very simplified, stylized uh, 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 way, an incomplete contract, because in this contract, effort is not specified. Yeah? I've argued why contracts are incomplete, why this is important. So what we have here is, in this experiment, this is the delib deliberacy of, ex of an experiment, we don't allow that possibility, uh, because this is something we think is irrelevant in naturally occurring conditions that uh, uh, we don't have. Uh, which is fully specified and enforceable. So we think, okay, um, we don't allow this, and it's the employer, the employee, who can choose how well he really works in this experiment. Uh, effort level one, you can think of just getting by. Effort level 20 means putting in lots and lots of effort. Yeah, that's the equivalent situation. And, but in the experiment, we pay them according to their decisions. So workers receive the wage that they've got offered and have to bear costs, whereas the costs increase in effort, so the, the, the take-home pay that they have is actually reduced if they choose higher effort levels. And for the uh, employer, it's the other way around. He earns a return, which increases in effort and has to pay the wage. So from a pure economic, if these gift exchange relationships don't matter, from a pure economic perspective, uh, and the, yeah, the employer has an incentive to pay the lowest possible wage, and the, 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 the worker, the employee, will choose the lowest effort level possible, whatever the wage is that he actually receives. Yeah? Irrespective of the wage, uh, he receives in this setting that we study here, he should choose the lowest possible effort level. Yeah? If he's a homo economicus, standard maximizing selfish individual, would choose the lowest effort irrespective of any wage he receives. So that's how this experiment is set up. Now you see, we can set up the experiment, and I spare you all the technical details, but the way we set it up, this experiment, is exactly to say that if this is the sole consideration, there is no other consideration, there is no strategic reason, there is no uh, social pressure, there is no nothing, there's no communication, it's just the basic incentives. Yeah, we should observe uh, uh, minimum, weight, minimum effort irrespective of the wage that, we, that the employer decides to pay. So this is not what happened, uh, and this is the first experimental proof for uh, the existence of a gift exchange in uh, controlled conditions where uh, uh, um, people, participants have an incentive to pay the lowest possible wage and have an incentive to choose the lowest possible effort. So what do you see here? You see here the wage on this, ac on this axis. In this experiment, this is just experimental money, but translated into real money. And this is the effort levels. So the prediction was, under the standard, selfish, maximizing, homo economicus, whatever the wage is, it should be, it should be down here. Because the, the incentive structure for the employee, for the worker in this experiment, is to choose the lowest possible effort, irrespective of the wage. But we observe something that resembles George Akilov's argument. The George Akilov's argument was employment relationships are governed by a gift exchange in many cases. That means good wages, high wages, high effort, high work morale, low wages, low effort, low work morale. And that's what we see yeah, on average. So this is um, 
very influential paper. Unfortunately, I'm not the co-author of this uh, because it's very well cited and uh, replicated study. Um, but um, it, it, it clearly demonstrates that George Akerlof did have a point, although he did have the means to test it that, that way back then. But OK, so now you can ask yourself, well, this is an experiment, and um, there are many possible, uh, you know, maybe, maybe this is just a one-off. Yeah? So uh, we ask ourselves, and that's again, the, this is the art and the technique and the job of experimental economists, how robust are these type of findings? And I show you some. So what if yeah, we run this experiment with new parameters? So obviously for any experiment you have to fix some parameters, how we do this experiment and so on. So we changed this and we did some more things. This I'm, I am a co-author of. Uh, and we changed the parameters and, and, uh, but we got uh, the same result. Yeah? So now we have a bit more confidence that the sort of gift exchange or reciprocity is actually a robust phenomenon. We have, we have replicated this in a new set of experiments. Yeah? This is an important task of any experimental science, is replication. And that's for what you need such nice labs for, that you can go and test under new conditions uh, to, to see whether the results that we have observed all hold up to replication. Yeah? So, as an economist in particular, you might ask yourself, well, you know, the state, obviously you pay in economic experiments. There is no economic experiment without paying, de depending on your decision. Everything I'm talking about and everything, 99.9% .9 of things that are published in economics, people are being paid according to their decision. So, but you could say, okay, the, the payments that we have, this is not a huge amount of money. So, uh, one important question, in particular in early research in experimental economics is, what if stakes are really high? Well, it's a bit difficult to study this with normal research budgets. I guess even Marsh's research budget, uh, Bob, I guess, uh, is, uh, doesn't allow for this. But, uh, you know, uh, Ernst Fehr uh, went to Russia, where at the time when he did these experiments, he could pay the equivalent of three months' salaries. This is a lot of money. Just think your salary times three, your monthly salary times three, and that's what you can earn on an experiment that lasts an hour or two. Yeah? As compared to... Uh, normal stakes, uh, this means what you typically pay in a lab experiment. And you see, for the gift exchange, this is the, again the wage and effort, it doesn't matter. You know, this, this, this result is not uh, going away if you increase the stakes. So an important, methodologically important uh, step for understanding that these results are not just limited to small stakes laboratory tasks. Okay? Well, can play the skeptic further on. You use student volunteers. Yeah, what can we learn from students? They are very special. What about real people? <laughs> so um, again, a very important concern. So uh, this study, I uh, looked at them. They took undergraduates, MBA students. And um, this is a study I was involved in. We used soldiers. So MBAs, these are people who, by definition of what an MBA is, have five, six, seven years of uh, work experience in a real job before they come back for a year or so to university to get further education. So they have work experience. Undergraduates are young people, the ones that typically take, take part in our experiments, uh, no work experience. Typically they have some work experience in soldiers in Austria. These were experiments conducted in Austria. Uh, typically are a bit older as well and have some work experience the way the, the drafting worked in Austria. So what you see here is, this is the white bars, is reciprocity of students. It's the weakest of all of them. Yeah, the, the MBAs with work experience and the soldiers with work experience, they do have a stronger, uh, a stronger uh, reciprocal response in the exact same situation. What does that mean? If you use students, everything I say about students, qualitatively there is no difference. Quantitatively, students are sort of the, the greediest bunch. And for real people, if you want, you know, reciprocity is even more important. So you can say, okay, well, it's still selected samples. What about representative, you know? Take the whole population. So here is a nice study of a comparable experiment uh, where they did experiments uh, in a representative sample of the, that of the, this is really representative of the Dutch population, the Dutch household survey. Again, uh, under two, these are two different measurements in these experiments, we get reciprocity. 
So again, this is not restricted. This is a general phenomenon that we have, that we, that we get here. We get this gift exchange. Yeah? High wage, high effort in this, in this stylized situation, admittedly low wages, low effort. So we can say, okay, it's still you know, just money. This is not real. You know? Choosing a number, like in my experiment, is very, uh, very artificial. This is not how work is. I, in my job, I don't choose a number. You know, I spend that many hours, I spend my brain cells, I do this, I do that. Uh, he's not choosing numbers. You know? uh, so it's what about uh, something, uh, something real? Yeah, very good question. Here is a study uh, by Uri Gnisi who did this. The real effort task is, um, is, uh, is not particularly uh, characteristic of labor markets, real labor markets either. People in these experiments were asked to solve mazes. You know, how to find your way through mazes. The more mazes you solve, the better, the, more, the higher the earnings of the employer were. But still what he observes in three conditions, higher wages in this experiment, more, more of those mazes actually being solved. Again, qualitatively, this is what reciprocity will predict. And finally, what if people don't even know that they are an experiment? You know, here you come, you economist, you come, you put people into the lab, you're being watched, you know, like the, the, under the microscope, and therefore maybe this explains some of the things. So here is a nice study of a so-called natural experiment because people don't even know that they're an experiment. It's a natural occurring situation where um, Armin Falk collaborated with a charity that sent out uh, solicitation letters to people, and these solicitation letters either contained a small gift, one card of such children's drawing, this was a, a charity for children, no such card or large gift, so a set of four uh, cards. 10,000 people, now you see, you know, going out of the laboratory has some advantages because typically we don't have 10,000 people in our experiments, but people obviously are randomly allocated to these conditions. What does reciprocity predict? Gift exchange, receiving, a, receiving a, a, a large set of cards should increase your propensity to donate. And uh, do you think that happened by now? I hope all of you believe it should happen. It's indeed the case, more cards, more donations. So this reciprocity is not, uh, is not restricted uh, to a laboratory artifact. So this, this, is a, this is just a selection of experiments. There are many more experiments that show this. Yeah, such experiments. So, <clears throat> are you surprised? No, I hope, yeah, by this. So, where are we? Taking stock for a moment. So, reciprocity, I hope to have to convince you, is a robust and highly replicable phenomenon in the laboratory. Yeah? Can, can it explain downward rate rigidity and is it relevant in experimental markets? That's the next question we will be asking. So we remember what I started my uh, motivation with. I started with this motivation. This is for those of you who studied economics. If not, this is model of supply and demand. This is the governing model that they introduced at the beginning of how we think markets work. Yeah? So if uh, something changes, uh, then uh, prices will adjust immediately. So this is what we think. And the question now is, I've only presented the first half of George Akerlo's argument. George Akerlo's argument is, Employment relationships are governed by quid pro quo. We can find laboratory conditions controlling for self-interested incentives and institutions and so on and so forth that show that this is a robust propensity. So this quid pro quo is on the table of being something economically relevant. Can it explain downward wage rigidity that I started out with as a motivation? That's still not, I have still have to deliver that. So that will be the next step. So now the benchmark of this is a very, very impressive set of experiments I cannot really talk about, but uh, basically in the history of experimental economics, extremely influential, connected with the name of another uh, 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 Nobel laureate, Vernon Smith, who, sh who studied this type of environment yeah? in ex using exp the tools of experimental economics. He's actually one of the founding fathers of modern experimental economics. And he showed that experimental markets like this, they actually work much like as in the textbook. So if you bring such a, such a model into the laboratory, even under conditions much weaker than what the textbook model would require, we observe that you know, if, if demand goes down, for example, and wages should go down, this is what we observe. Yeah. 
if, H, if this you can do all the changes here that you would like, if this goes up, it goes up and uh, the wages go up. This is what we observe in laboratory markets. Yeah, so markets work like economic theory has assumed it would. So now, what's the caveat here or the hint here? The caveat is that I have argued that the employment relationship differs from such markets in that the, the contract is incomplete, whereas this assumes contracts are complete. So what happens in markets when contracts are incomplete? This is the starting point, yeah, where gift exchange possibly can matter. The question is, does it have a consequence for wage formation when, markets are, when contracts are incomplete? And that's what I want to study now, because the question is, can this gift exchange explain downward wage rigidity? Yeah, as, well, that was one of the George Akerlo's argument, that he can. But again, uh, he, he, was, he based his ideas on some casual observations and then logic. Yeah. Here I based the idea of the, the, the set of results I've already shown and some further experimental tests in experimental markets. And then I will step out of the laboratory. So, um, so we do in these experiments, uh, we do three so-called three treatments, three conditions under which that we study and that we have as, ex, as, ex, as experimenters the liberty of changing them to study this. One we call the bilateral gift exchange. It's a so-called one-shot bilateral contracts of one employee with one firm. So Maros and I are contracting in this, and then I move on to, to, to Bob and so on. It's always just bilateral, just me and, me and somebody else, and it's never ongoing. Yeah? So it's, this is what, what means one-shot. So then we compare this. This means, this is, why is this interesting? This means there is no competition. Now we introduce competition, we introduce a market. That's what we call the gift exchange market. And now we introduce a situation where the employers are in a strong position. In a strong position because there are more of them as compared to employee. Uh, there are fewer of them as compared to employees. So there are more employees, an excess supply of employees, people in the role of an employee. Uh, in particular, the typic, in these experiments, we had nine to 12 employees and six to eight firms uh, or employers. And they can only employ one worker in this experiment. So there's competition. So the, 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 the workers, the employees, only earn something in this experiment if they actually find an employer. They earn nothing if they don't find one. But four of them are bound not to find one. So there is lots of pressure of accepting low wages. There's competition. This is the idea of this experiment. There's pressure to, to lower wages because otherwise, you know, a low wage is better than being unemployed in this experiment. Yeah? So that's the rationale. There's competition. And then? We compare this to a situation of a complete contract market. So now, you know, by design, by experimental design, we can, we can make the contract complete by saying, you know, you have to supply a particular effort level. This is like the car example. You know, this is what you have to deliver and we can enforce it. And so there, this type of quick pro quo doesn't matter because the contract is complete. So, does, so doesn't, what happens in this setting? According to Akerlof and uh, the way we set up experiments, if uh, age, age factors are rational and self-serving, then this would mean the, they have an incentive, the way we set up the experiment, to choose the minimum effort. And uh, the employers have an incentive and are in a strong position to pay the minimum wage. Yeah. But uh, from what I have told you before, the, the, the alternative hypothesis is wage and effort will be positively correlated. And if this gift exchange is strong enough, then we should observe wage rigidity. Yeah. So because firms then have, from a profit maximizing point of view, because, you know, no reason to uh, lower wages. So what happens? Uh, this is the prediction. This is what happens. Yeah. So again, we replicate uh, this reciprocity relationship. And it doesn't differ between the bilateral situation where Maros and I do not have to compete with one another as compared to a situation where uh, the workers, the employers have to compete to find a job. Yeah. Given that they are employed, they behave the same. So competition does not affect this gift exchange relationship per se. Yeah. High wage, high effort, low wage, low effort. What does it mean for uh, wages? Uh, they might be rigid in the in the, given the strength of this relationship in the bilateral gift exchange, the gift exchange market, but not in the complete contract market. And uh, so 
the way I show you this is this was an experiment that was repeated a few times to observe this, to be able to observe whether wages actually de deteriorate over time or, or not. And, um, and this is what, and here is average wages on this axis. So higher, higher up, higher wages. So the, the, the lowest possible wage is 20. So this is what happens in the bilateral gift exchange. No way across this experiment that wages would go down. And what about competition? So this is, well, is, how surprising is that? It is to some extent surprising because it means that um, uh, the, 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 the incentive are still, you know, it, this, uh, this means that we really have to have strong enough of a gift exchange to make this a profitable move in the experiment. But in the gift exchange market, you know, there is, a, but there is no competition. You can say maybe this is lack of competition. Now in the gift exchange market, we have competition. And it doesn't impact at all on the wages that we observe in this experiment. So wages are rigid. Yeah. So now, is this proof that uh, gift exchange, incomplete contracts cause wage rigidity? No, it's not, because we have to show Maybe there is some inherent reason why these experiments, people don't want to lower their wages. So we have to compare this to a situation of the complete contract market. For this, it's important, again, complete contracts mean effort doesn't matter, it's fixed. So it's only about wages. And since, you know, in this experiment, uh, there are more employees, more workers than, than firms. You know, the, the firms are in a strong position, they can push the wages down. So wages should be much lower and going down. And that's what we get. Yeah. They don't go down to the level that was predicted for various reasons, but they are clearly much lower. And they are much lower from the beginning. So that means um, uh, that it's indeed the case, this illustrates um, two things, uh, or three things. Competition does not matter for wage rigidity in these experiments. And consistent with uh, Akerlof's theory, reciprocity can cause rigid wages. So this is experimental support for the gift exchange theory of the employment relationship and the labor market. Yeah, this is endogenously, now this is, you know, we can look at the data in more detail, this is our indeed profit maximizing move, so the experiment, participants in these experiments actually did earn more uh, uh, by having high wages than by paying low wages, for this, the reason being this reciprocity relationship. So, well you can say, what do we learn about uh, things in the laboratory? I mean, I've already taken some small steps out of the lab, but what if we leave the lab? But before we leave the lab, we should keep in mind the following. We can predict behavior, what we have learned, you know, we can predict behavior in uh, experimental labor markets that model aspects of the situation we think is really relevant in, rele in the real world situations. You know, the generic aspects, important aspects of real world employment relationships. So we have achieved something. We can predict what people will do here under a robust set of conditions. Yeah. We have support for an important theory of the labor market whose importance, I think, has become uh, bigger with this type of support. And it provides an important support for the argument that endogenous wage rigidity is possible. So it's not just the trade unions and the labor regulations that can, can lead to, to wage rigidity. It's equally possible, which is not to say that th these things don't matter at all in reality, but it's equally possible that this is endogenous because of these moral effects that wages and, and, um, and in, in employment relationship can have. So <clears throat> now we leave the lab um, and um, enter real workplaces by which um, we still keep the experimental methodology for, our, for the reasons that I explained, but now we move out of the laboratory situation. You know, so far, people have been sitting in this nice lab and behind some blinds and computers and they make their decisions and it's all a bit artificial. It has helped us getting these clean insights into people's behavior. Now, we have to get our hands a bit dirtier by moving into uh, real workplaces. So here's an example of still an experiment, but people don't know that they are taking part in the experiment. There are many such versions now, they're so-called field experiments. These are experiments under naturally occurring conditions where under many of which people don't even know that they are taking part in an experiment. They are invited to do a particular task which the experimenter, the scientists, the economists have structured in a way that is an experiment, which means controlled condition changes and so on. Now this is one example, stuffing envelopes. 
in this, paper, in this particular one. So, <clears throat> well, uh, here is a, a, a study that I like a lot because it was a big surprise for me. Uh, so they do this, they ask people, they have a big library, and they ask people to do an, a data entry task for two hours. And um, uh, uh, at the beginning of the second hour, they an, uh, uh, announce a wage increase, uh, which uh, amounted to something like a 10% wage increase, which is not too small given the baseline wage. And shock, horror, my nice reciprocity result from the laboratory has gone. No reciprocity in this condition. So maybe it's still you know, um, a, a laboratory artifact, but what then if you look at this data more closely, there one important thing that, um, that occurred is that um, it was not clear what a wage increase actually means in terms of how is this nice or not nice, or you know, is, could this, is this low or high? You know, could they do better? So it was unclear what, uh, whether, this is, uh, whether this is a good wage or not. Yeah? This is in contrast to all these laboratory conditions. When in the laboratory experiment, every participant could tell immediately what a good wage is. Yeah? The way we structured the experiment, a high wage is clear what that means in the context of the experiment. A low wage is clear what that means in the context of the experiment. This is true in all these conditions. But in this situation, it was not clear. So is, it, is that the case? So, well, unfortunately, or maybe reluctantly, we go back to the lab. So our small step into the muddy world uh, leaves, us, leaves, on, leaves us in the cold and we have to venture back into the laboratory to study uh, whether um, this argument is actually true. So, so what they do in the lab is they replicate this, this again in the lab, but they replicate exactly the situation. Uh, that led to this, and um, they increase the wages uh, by 10%. Nothing happens in the lab if people don't know what the surplus is, so whether this is a high wage or a low wage. You know, then they let people know through various uh, experimental manipulations what the surplus is, and here we get reciprocity back. You know, high wage, wage increase, now increases uh, real work. This is real effort. You know, they enter, this is a data entry task, they enter substantially more uh, if they get a better wage. You know? This is now, again, this is, this is field experimental evidence uh, 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 of, of a, real, a real effort task evidence that, uh, uh, of reciprocity. Provided people can gauge, you know, can understand, can judge whether this is nice or not. Yeah? So, this leads to a very important observation that, uh, we, um, uh, that this, the, 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 the currency of reciprocity, what reciprocity actually means, might matter a lot outside the world, and it's much less clear in naturally occurring conditions what that means. Again, uh, this is a very nice study that just got published. Um, and uh, again, it's data entry tasks. They have a baseline pay of 12 uh, euros, and they do an unannounced increase in pay. So, the way this works uh, is that uh, they pay them seven, seven euros and then either or, or, depending on the condition, they give them a gift. This is a thermos of worth seven, seven, seven euros. This is a, 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 a origami made out of a two euro coin and a smiley face and a five, uh, five euro note, but folded everything nicely together and put into an envelope as a gift. So the question is, you know, um, um, what does this have any impact on, on, on reciprocity here, yeah? on this data entry? Again, people don't know that they are taking part in an experiment. So, um, here are the results. This is an experiment where people just receive money as a compensation, nothing of that. So, just money, just seven euros, you know, if the, uh, in addition to this 12. Euros, so this unannounced increase in pay is just seven euros. Basically, nothing statistically significantly happens. Yeah. Wages, the effort, the data entry just increases by five percentage points, which is nothing. Again, reciprocity, this is not reciprocity. People, people pocket the money and say thank you. And they just continue working at the same pace and at the same quality as they did before. However, if they receive this bottle, 
as compared to the baseline, rather than the seven, the seven pound, the seven euros, now performance increases dramatically. This is just symbolic. Even if it has a price tag on that says this bottle costs seven pound, seven euros, yeah, so they know, okay, I have just received seven euros, but they gave me a bottle. Yeah, it increases performance. And even if people have a choice, where they can say you can have seven euros in cash or the bottle, most people choose the bottle and increase performance. And when it comes to the origami, so which means that the experimenter has spent some time or the employer, you know, to put a nice gift together, you know, the performance increases by 30%. Yeah. So, again, what's important about this? Uh, two two things you can argue. The, um, the, the, the one objection could be, or one argument could be, this just tells you that lab results are not generalizable. Yeah. This is the lack of generalizability of lab results because, actually. Quite a few studies, I mean, the one that I just showed you before got something similar under some conditions. You know, just paying money outside doesn't do very much. Um, but what is the real important thing is that the perceptions actually matter. How do people perceive this? Uh, what is being nice here in this situation? So you can argue, OK, the, the, we have learned a lot from this, from the lab and the field. What about combining it? So this is the last study in this line of research I, I discuss. And the task here is, again, and this is a natural experiment, a field experiment where participants don't know that they are taking part in an experiment. So they are hired by a, a news company who distribute newspapers for four weeks at two locations in Switzerland, in Zurich. And they change the wage from 22 Swiss francs to 27. But now, having learned these results, they ask them, the important thing is, you know, there is no natural benchmark, really. I mean, it's like a, you have to judge what, what 22 means. Now, this is real money, but so they ask people, what do you think? How fair is that? I don't show you these results, but they're not, they're not particularly important for my argument now. But they know the fairness perception of people yeah, here. So, and what they also do, what, what else they do is they, they they invite some of these people to the laboratory and ask them a standard lab experiments where they measure reciprocity in this clean way that I have shown before. Yeah, and then they can see what, uh, what that means. So here is the result. And, uh, so you, we, have two, we can group people into two groups. Those who say the base wage is adequate. So that means this 22 is actually a good payment for the type of job. And those who say the base wage is actually uh, pretty, pretty lousy, yeah, who think 22 is not enough. And here is the reaction uh, here. So uh, you know, going from 22 to 27, for those who think the base wage is adequate, you know, they are fairly paid. They think, OK, this, this, this particular gift is a bit too much. It doesn't change, really. Uh, those who think the base wage is low and then receive a good wage, yeah, they increase their performance dramatically, again, consistent with the laboratory findings. And what they also show very nicely, those who are reciprocal in a lab experiment are also uh, more reciprocal in this type of naturally occurring situation. So the laboratory behavior is not an artifact. People take their psychology out of the laboratory into the naturally occurring uh, world uh, to, and then, then they decide how to behave. So I have a very, some brief things to say about the second part, what this implies for a, a, a further understanding of employment relationship. But before I do that, I wrap up this part. We have shown, I think, this is just a glimpse of the research on this area, that the employment relationship is a social relationship. Norms of reciprocity matter and can explain wage rigidity. And we can predict behavior of human behavior in these labor markets if we know how people perceive the situation. Yeah. If the employment relationship is a social relationship, then this might also have important implications for the behavioral consequences of explicit incentives, which is the last thing I want to very briefly talk about before we conclude. So the behavioral consequences of incentives if gift exchange matters. Because I have given a very stylized situation but in, in, of, of employment relationships. We have looked at simple tasks, but many tasks in reality, they use some sort of performance incentives. So what does that mean? Yeah, what, what are the behavioral consequences of incentives? Very briefly, I, I introduce you to this ongoing research, which I had the pleasure of teaching to the students here um, uh, in, as part of the Erskine uh, uh, Fellowship teaching. 
So in this experiment, um, we introduce an incentive contract. Now we make the contract a little bit more complete. We give an incentive. We allow for an incentive. And the incentive contract is very simple here. The incentive contract means I reduce your wage if the effort is lower than the desired effort. And uh, from a homo economicus perspective, as a maximizing individual, you will deliver the desired effort if you lose more than you would actually gain. So if the wage reduction, the, weight, the amount by which I reduce your wage, exceeds what you serve, what you save in terms of effort costs. So with, um, without, um, without telling you the exact all details here, the important thing is the following. Now this is no incentives here. So incentives are not relevant. And the economic prediction would be this is what we should get. And this is what actual effort means. So these are observations of actual effort. When, when the, the economic prediction is we should all be one, the level one. Yeah, we have a few observations at level one, but quite a few, many observations above the level, which again shouldn't be a big surprise because this is gift exchange we have seen before. But what happens if the incentive contract is incentive, the contract is incentive compatible in this, in this sense? So now, as a selfish individual, I have an incentive to do what the contract asks me to do. So this is optimal effort on this axis. And uh, this red line is the, the economic prediction here, what a selfish homo economicus would do in this situation, who has no concern for gift exchange or anything, and this is what people do, yeah, with a few exceptions. So in this case, yeah, if the contract is incentive compatible, people behave like homo economicus in this situation. Homo economicus is now all of a sudden back. If there is an incentive contract, this is how people behave. Yeah. This doesn't matter whether people are fair-minded initially. So we have another set of experiments to judge this. These are you know, people we classify as fair-minded, and people we classify as selfish. They behave exactly the same in this condition. Incentives work again as the economic textbook would say people would behave. So now we have two sets of results. You know, we have this set of results that gift exchange matters, but we also have this result. And this tells you, yeah, why is that important? It says because the, the, the way people perceive the situation, you know, how the contract is perceived, whether this is a quid pro quo or whether this is an economic exchange relationship will govern how people will behave. If they think this is an economic exchange, then the rules of economic exchange will govern people's behavior. If they think this is quid pro quo and reciprocity, niceness against niceness and uh, meanness against meanness, then this is what governs people's behavior. Yeah? So, but this is not that all this doesn't mean that, that people don't understand incentives. People, you know, people understand incentives. It doesn't matter whether people are in generally fair-minded or selfish. If they're exposed to incentives, this is what governs most people's behavior. Yeah? If there are no incentives, or if the contract is not incentive compatible, we are back to gift exchange. So both, you know, both minds, both things are relevant for how people behave. Does this matter in reality? Yeah? The point is, this is the last experiment I show very briefly, a field experiment. Does this, mind, does this type of things matter outside the laboratory? And the point is incentives change the nature of the relationship. A very nice demonstration of this is a field experiment by Ignisi and Rustichini from Israel, from Israel where they did experiments in a kindergarten where the issue is that people come late to pick up their children, which imposes cost on the kindergarten. What does an economist uh, propose? Uh, just increase a fine, then people will uh, not, don't come late. So is that true? So they do an experiment, 20 weeks, 10 daycare centers, six of them are so-called treatment, which means they have a fine, and four don't have a fine. In the control group, they just observe how people behave over time in these 20 weeks. In the experimental group, they change it after four weeks. In the first four weeks, there are no fines. Then they introduce the fines, then they take them away. So what happens? So this is the control group. So no fine in the control group. This is the amount of uh, late coming parents. It doesn't change over time. Well, what happens in the test group? You know, those who after four weeks get the fine. Economic theory says, so if you have introduced the fine, you should, the, you know, the, 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 the bad behavior should be reduced because coming, now, now coming late is costly. So what we should observe in the first four weeks is, is basically the same as here. Maintenance should go down. Yeah. And what did you observe? 
it goes up to the exact opposite. And once incentives are abolished, this happens in the last, uh, in the last in after week 16, you know, the good behavior is crowded out. Yeah, they don't come back to this. Yeah, they are much higher now. Now, now we have destroyed the norm. Yeah? This is now, now the, 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 the laws of uh, economic exchange govern this relationship. And economic exchange, to some extent, although this is not exactly what econom economists would have predicted, they would have predicted it should go down here. But it's clearly the case. You know, this, this paper is called A Fine is a Price. So people think, OK, now I pay for being, being late. I don't even have a bad conscience. And that governs it. So the, the general point of this is, of the previous the lab experiment that I showed you and these field experiments is that incentives change the nature of the relationship. And what is important is how people perceive it. Yeah, that's, the, that's the general thing. How do people perceive it? And that will govern whether they are in economic exchange mode, meaning they are more or less homo economicus, or whether they are in quid pro quo reciprocity mode. So I conclude. The employment relationship, this was the main point here today, tonight, is that it's a social relationship and this observation has potentially important consequences for our understanding of labor markets and behavioral reactions to incentives. I've presented a research program to, uh, to study this and I argue, you know, maybe not particularly surprising as the speaker of the NC Experimental Economics Lecture Series uh, I like the lab, so, uh, you know, but I also like the field, the field. And I think the lab, you know, this combination of lab and field is actually what brings us forward because the lab is really good at detecting basic, basic propensities of how people behave, controlling for economic incentives that might matter. But the field is there to check to what extent the, the lab propensities actually carry over to the field. And we have, con we have uncovered, going back and forth, we have uncovered some important... Uh, Things and I think you know this is really not the end of this, and we not the last word on our understanding of employment relationships. It's I think one important step in, the, in this direction of making economics as a discipline, labor economics in particular, you know, more uh, in line with real world and, and real people, rather than just thinking how they should behave and that we always assume people are selfish and profit maximizing and all that. You know it depends what they are, and what this depends means that's what we need to understand. I think this hopefully contributes uh, to our to to this understanding. Thank you very much. <laughs>